let me also uh, introduce the panel. Really, uh, Harris Gilbert, having been a star of stage and screen so far today, doesn't need any introduction, but he is a graduate of Yale University and the Chicago Law School, was an assistant district attorney uh, in Nashville, 1957 to 59, and a former president of the Tennessee Bar Association, and as you already know, a key figure in the uh, Baker versus Carr case, sitting beside him. Also a graduate of Vanderbilt with a BA and JD degree and, and an LLM from Harvard in 1962 is Judge Gilbert Merritt, who was a U.S. attorney for the Middle District of Tennessee from 1966 to 69 and was appointed in 1977 as a judge for the uh, United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit and continues to serve as a senior judge in that capacity today. And uh, beside him, the gentleman you just saw on the screen, John J. Hooker, a man I refer to as the Forrest Gump of the Nashville Bar Association because he has done so many amazing things uh, and he has, has, has done them over the course of a very colorful career which I think really got started when he was a member of the famous class of 1957 at Vanderbilt Law School along with such people as uh, Tom Shriver, uh, Jim Neal, Tom Higgins, John Hollins and a multitude of other people whose names have been uh, etched in the history of our city. So let me uh, let me turn it over to them and uh, first of all give them a welcome. They've been here all <laughs> afternoon. <clears throat> the involvement uh, of the three of you in this case is, is, is actually very different but at, at the same time you're you're sort of members of the same generation. I'm going to ask Judge Merritt if you don't mind starting just to, to tell us what it was like for you to suddenly be thrust into the aftermath of Baker versus Carr when you made your argument in the district court after the remand. Yeah, I got into it after the remand from the Supreme Court. <clears throat> and at that time, 1962, would have been the summer of 1962, there were a lot of things going on in Nashville. The vote on the Metro government the lunch counter, the Hoffa trial, there were really, I mean, there's a lot of news going on, and this case came back, and I was a young lawyer, I had just come back from Harvard Law School, and uh, had had some uh, courses that dealt in some detail with the case, uh, and I went to work for a man named Edwin Hunt, who was an elderly lawyer in Nashville, and in the middle of his representation, of, we were representing the Tennessee Farm Bureau, but we were actually also representing the state of Tennessee, so I was on the wrong side when the case came back. And we were arguing, and I ended up arguing because he had a heart attack. We were arguing after the case came back uh, the legislature met, to make a long story short, and by the way, if you have any questions or you're unclear about something that you want to know about, raise your hand and ask a question. The Tennessee legislature met after Baker v. Carr came back from the Supreme Court the first time. The governor called a special session of the legislature, which met in about May or so, or June, May, I guess it was, of uh, 1962. And they adopted <coughs> um, a reapportionment. They, that legislature was apportioned on the basis of the, the uh, old reapportionment, which hadn't been cha <coughs> changed in 50 years. But it was a messed up thing itself, what the legislature had done at the special session. And so <clears throat> what we were really employed to do by the Tennessee Farm Bureau, and I remember going with Mr. Hunt up to see General McCandless, who was the Attorney General, and they wanted us to uphold a legislative scheme in which one house of the state legislature, in this case, of course, Tennessee, would be uh, subject to close apportionment and the other house would be left alone uh, kind of on a analogy with to some extent the United States Congress the House of Representatives and the uh, Senate of the United States and 
Uh, I'll tell you a little later what, we had a hearing then in state courts, uh, I mean in federal court, with Judge Miller, who was on the earlier panel, and Judge Wyke, who was on the Sixth Circuit, and let's see, who else was on there? Judge Boyd, who Boyd from Memphis, who was a federal district judge. And these three judge panels are set up by statute to deal with uh, unconstitutional statutes. And so that's why we had a three judge panel rather than a <coughs> single federal district judge. And the appeals then went directly from the three judge panel to the Supreme Court. So we heard, um, I argued that the Tennessee, what the Tennessee legislature had done was constitutional uh, because it had reapportioned the General Assembly, the lower house, uh, but they was not required to reapportion the upper house, the Senate, state Senate. And the three judge panel in the end disagreed with that argument. I lost that argument. Um, and um, a lot of things happened after that. I might say that I, what really happened was that the legislature had to come back, reapportion again, and while they were doing that in 1963, they decided they wanted the Constitution of Tennessee, the legislative article, the first article, to be rewritten. And uh, so there was a Constitutional Convention in a year, and I ran for the Constitutional Convention as a delegate and got elected, and I'll tell you about that if we have time. All right, I want to ask uh, Harris, if you would, to give us a, a quick idea of your game plan on the appeal. You had, you had lost, uh, kind of as you expected to lose in the, in the district court on a motion to dismiss, and you know that, that because there was no trial, there's really not much of a record. So how did you overcome that? Uh, by going around the federal rules of civil procedure, uh, can, federal we, can we Number cut that eight, part out of the tape? Uh, <laughs> in simple language, uh, Federal Rule Civil Procedure Rule 8 says you have a short and plain statement of your case, and uh, that should be it. Well, we knew pretty much that we were going to get bounced out in the lower court because of Cold Grove and also the composition of the two judges, Martin and, and uh, uh, Boyd uh, did not offer us a very palatable uh, panel. We thought Judge Miller would be with us, but in any event, we decided we were going to put everything we had in the pleading because it was going to go up on pleadings. And you get before the Supreme Court, they're going to ask questions about reality, about facts. So we had this book composed by the Planning Commission of Davidson County, uh, Nashville, Davidson County. And this one's autographed by Ben West. I took it out of the archives this morning. And it details in great, to great length the, uh, I'm afraid Jerry Flippin might disagree with me, but it shows the tax revenues that go to the counties that are overrepresented, or double that of the counties underrepresented. In fact, the lowest county in terms of, I just happened to pick it up, one section in here. Per pupil, for ADA pupils, Shelby County's the lowest, before 100, below $100, $99. The second lowest, what would you think? Davidson County about 125, the rest of them are 250 and above, and so on. We go on and on and on, I don't want to belabor the point. But we want to put that in for a reason, not because the Supreme Court of the United States have any jurisdiction of over taxation, but this was ahead of time. We knew that the cornerstone of Frankfurter's position was that a well-informed electorate, the people of the state, would correct this evil in the long run, that there would be a correction made. Well. Our point, and we made this point in argument before, judge, uh, before the Supreme Court, that the, there's nothing you can do about the tax system, but the problem is it shows you there's no incentive or reason why this will ever change in the state. Because when you got counties getting three and four times what they're getting in the three or four metropolitan cities, or the West Tennessee counties were getting the big share, East Tennessee Republican counties were getting shafted. That's just all there is to it. And we kept this thing on a bipartisan basis. And this book shows that. Also, it shows the ease with which you can reapportion a state. As <clears throat> former President Bill Clinton said recently, it's just plain arithmetic. It's just plain arithmetic. 
you can do this, fellas. You don't need a great statistician. You, we showed you right here four or five alternate plans for reapportioning the state of Tennessee without going to an election at large. It's there for you. Simple arithmetic, as we tried to show it. We then uh, got a 60 year study of every bill that had been presented to the state legislature for reapportionment. Echoing what Mac Davis said happened to him, it had happened to every legislator for 60 years who proposed a bill for reapportionment. Never got to a vote. They never did a thing about reapportionment over 60 years. So we were aiming for Frankfurter's argument, and we were looking for a couple of votes on the Supreme Court. We were anticipating four, three, five, four, something in that area but we wanted to cut down Frankfurter's strength on that well-informed electorate will right the wrong. Our view was the wrong cannot be eliminated so long as there's power and money. And that's what this case is all about, folks. Don't listen to all this legal stuff. It's power and money because if you're not getting it, you're going to fight for it. So we took the appeal, uh, in the hand, put the hands of Washington lawyer Charles Ryan, um, who Ben West paid for through the city council. And we met many times in Washington to, form, uh, to formulate our uh, petition. I mean, it's not a petition for certiorari. It's known as a um, jurisdictional statement. And if the Supreme Court grants it, they, they have a strange rule. Four judges can grant it. It doesn't take five to grant uh, probable jurisdiction. Four would grant, and we got four. Who were they? We didn't know at the time. It was Warren, Black, Douglas, and Brennan. And who were the five against? Stewart, Whitaker, Clark, Harlan, and Frankfurt. We knew from that lineup right away that we had to go for Stewart, Potter Stewart, and for Whitaker. The whole appeal to the Supreme Court, frankly, was aimed at one Supreme Court judge because Whitaker, and by the way, Whitaker tore into the state of Tennessee several times in oral argument. He was very bothered by the situation, but uh, we uh, never could figure out where he was going. Clark, and we felt was sure with uh, Frankfurter, and so we put the argument, everything was put to <coughs> for Justice Potter Stewart. Now, what happened? We picked a lawyer who was very friendly with the Republican administration, which was in. He'd been a classmate of Lee Rankin. He'd been a, a good friend of Nixon. And he was a good man, but we got jurisdiction granted. We decided we got to get the United States, the United States government on our side, better known as the Solicitor General. Uh, Bobby Kennedy was Attorney General. The Solicitor General was one of the most outstanding <laughs> legal scholars in America, named Archibald Cox, a Harvard Law graduate, a man that commanded tremendous respect. An appointment was made for us John Hooker and John Siegenthaler, who couldn't be here today because of his own uh, uh, matter that was, he, he was honored today and his family felt it was enough for one day for him. Uh, they got us a point with Archibald Cox. And that was, in our opinion, the turning point in the case because it turned out that Cox made the argument that got Potter Stewart to go with us, change his vote, so to speak. We had no idea what, how the voting was going. The questioning from judges can often fool you. You never know exactly where they're going. But Potter Stewart was a little bit skeptical of us to start with and uh, in the argument, but he liked the argument. In fact, he, got it, he was the person we've later found, after many years of searching through the records, he was the one that got to have the case re argued again, which is unusual. Six hours of argument. And what was the basic argument that Cox used it was a minimalist argument. Instead of all the things that have been done wrong, all the stuff going on in Tennessee that could be remedied, it was simply this. Does this case set forth a jurisdictional basis, a basis for a federal court to act? Does it state a cause of action? And has it got merit? If it's true, then what happens? And that is all they decide. Not to do anything. No one man, one vote was decided in, that, in this Baker versus Carr case. No system that was decided. And what happened? We got the vote of Stewart. But as a bonus, some really great whipping, or great uh, chocolate on top of the ice cream, so to speak, we got Justice Clark, 
who at the last minute, we found from records and memos and letters later on, 30, 40 years later, he had voted four straight times with Frank Furter against us. But he took the record and got this record and got some other materials that we'd submitted and said, this is the worst possible thing I can imagine in Tennessee. It's an absolute crazy quilt. It is crazy what they've allowed to go on. And it's a top, it's, it's, he called it a topsy turvical of gigantic proportions, a crazy quilt. And he says, I would decide the case right here and now. I wouldn't even send it back to a lower court. This act is so unconstitutional, we're wasting time by sending it back, which is not what he should do, but that's what he said. He had become an absolute advocate for our side. And uh, it shows you that sometimes you uh, uh, anticipate these problems, and I've talked to Ed Yarbrough about this. A lot of things I learned uh, from this case, a lot, of, a lot of the things I'd never realized how important was to make your arguments to an appellate court very simply. Is that true, mm -hmm. Judge? Harris, Try to let keep me, it as uh, simple as possible. <laughs> uh, as, as my Can we ask him that question? No. Yeah. So let anyway, me, uh, I just wanted to, you just, just I just, for a second. I just wanted to get the background hard. of how we proceeded with the argument and what our aim was. Our aim was to get Potter Stewart's vote and to keep Earl Warren in line because he'd been a governor in California. Okay. And we were a little bit afraid he might get too much embroiled in the political side. But he really responded to that question. What about this tax money? What has this got to do with it? And we told him, he says, well, I understand it now. Uh, I, I was living at Bobby's house and working on this Hopper case. And I got a call from Tommy Osmond said, I'd like to come see you. And would you get me an appointment with the Attorney General? And I said, yeah, I'd be happy to. And, uh, and, and, and did. And he and Harris Kilbert uh, came to, uh, to Washington to meet with the Attorney General. And it, it snowed, had a, ma a major snow that day. And uh, Bobby came in about 2 o'clock in my office and said, uh, look, I, I can't, uh, uh, I got to go home. The kids, there's snow in. They all want me to go slaying with them. And I know I got this appointment with Tommy Osmond, but I'm going to let uh, Archie Cox, who was the Solicitor General, former teacher at, at uh, Harvard, I, I, I'm going to let him see uh, uh, Archie, I, I, my kids want me, I got to go home. And uh, uh, he was my ride since I was living in his house. I said, what am, what am I going to do? How am I going to? We laughed and he said, well, you'll work that out. And, and he went home and, and was not there for the meeting. But we did have the meeting with, with Archie Cox, Harris Gilbert, Tommy Osmond, myself. <laughs> If you ask Harris Gibbons about it, I remember that I put my feet up on on on, on Archie's desk, and uh, I think uh, that that Harris Gibbons was just horrified. That I, they had this magnificent room, and and this this was a Solicitor General of the United States, and the old hooker uh, had my feet up on his desk, and and uh, I, I think uh, uh, Harris Gibbons thought, well, "It's rude. Why is he doing that?" Well, I had done it sort of inadvertently because. Uh, Archie Cox and I shared the same office. I was the national head of lawyers and professional people, uh, lawyers, doctors, and professional people for Kennedy. And I had a desk in, in, the, in the headquarters, and next to my desk was, was Archie Cox's desk, and he was a, one of Tom, uh, Tom, uh, Sorensen's speech writers, and he had several other projects that he was involved in. But we were in the same room, in a small room, and so, so far that I frequently put my feet on, on, on his desk in this little quarters, and he would put his feet on mine. And so I don't know, just uh, we were, here we were in this magnificent, but I reached up, put my feet on him. I think it, uh, Harris Gibbard thought I was crazy. But anyway, that's the context of it. But we had this meeting, and it was very intellectually uh, stimulating. I didn't know that much about the essence of the legal aspect of it, and so I was sort of a listener in the matter, but it got down to a very esoteric argument and discussion with Archie Cox, who was an intellectualist from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, and Tommy and Harris both. Ha Harris, uh, uh, Gilbert, as you know, is a highly intelligent man, and as was Tommy Austin. And they uh, addressed the question of whether or not the, the Supreme Court would in entertain the jurisdiction, whether or not the, the Supreme Court would, would go beyond the question of that this is a political thicket. Tommy Osmond was a brilliant man, and so was Harris Gilbert, and I was pl pr uh, privileged to listen to this discussion, uh, which I was not really, uh, I hadn't done any, any work on the subject matter, and so I was just sort of a, a listener, and I listened to this, what was in effect a debate between this Harvard law professor 
and these two Nashville lawyers. And uh, I can tell you that these two Nashville lawyers uh, very well held at their uh, own against this Harvard law professor, and who was, who was to, to some degree compromised in the sense that Frank Furter had been Archie Cox's teacher in law school. And, and Archie was not prone to want to go over there and argue with uh, a case of, as a solicitor general in front of Frank Furter, who had an opposite position which was well entrenched that uh, the court shouldn't get involved in, politi in any political thicket. But uh, uh, by God, they, they, they uh, talked him into it. And so then they are too fast, by we get back to work at normal. And, and, uh, and uh, uh, Archie goes in and recommends to, to, uh, to Bobby that, he, that the Department of Justice uh, get in the case. And so uh, Bobby gave him a full audience about that. When he got through the audience, he said, well, you know, I'm just not going to do that. Uh, you know, I got no business getting in, in uh, Baker versus Carr. This is a lawsuit. This, uh, this is a political matter. Uh, uh, and after all, we're going to run again for re-election. Uh, all these uh, legislators in Tennessee are Democrats. Uh, why do I want to go down there and, and uh, get in a big fight with the Democrats? We lost Tennessee anyway, and we don't want, we're going to run again. And we don't want to lose it again. And, and why should I go down there and get in a fight with the Democratic leadership of Tennessee? I'm not going to do it. And Archie said, well, you know, I can understand that. But uh, I think this, if you want to do it, Mr. Attorney General, you got a license. I think you can do this. And a lot of that emanated from the power uh, of the arguments advanced by Tommy Osmond and, and Harris Gilbert. And I want to congratulate See? you. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I didn't realize why, why, you, why you were doing that. I thought you were just. <laughs> this is an educational <laughs> program for face. everyone. <laughs> now, uh, John Jay, I hope you don't mind me referring to you as Forrest Gump, but, but here you are, a young lawyer. You're 28 or so, I think, when you get involved with, with the, uh, the school field deal, and then you go up to Washington and, and you're special assistant to Bobby Kennedy in the Justice Department. How did you uh, push him over the edge, or did you, uh, to get him into the Speaker case? Well, uh, the fact is that, that uh, Bobby invited me to, he'd come down here as you heard it, and testified in the school for your impeachment trial. And I then went and campaigned for him all over the United States. And, and, and I did various uh, chores for, for, for Bobby. One of the chores I did was to get together all the information that Jack had ever said on the subject of religion. And so I presented to Bobby the first draft of what turned out to be the Houston religious speech that ultimately Ted Sorensen rewrote a course and Jack delivered, which was the sort of a defining moment in the, in the campaign when Jack sort of liberated himself from the Pope and convinced people that the fact that he was a Catholic was not relevant to the proposition he wanted to be president of the United States. So I'd ha I, I was a national director of, of uh, of the lawyers and doctors for, for Kennedy, and I'd call up the, all these uh, highfalutin people. And I had been a private in the United States Army, uh, uh, a buck private. And I'm all of a sudden calling Judge uh, General Ridgway, who was a four-star general, and, and talking to him. And I, I felt sort of silly, you know, he had my private, this is four-star general. And me trying to get, uh, and, and General Madaris, you know, the, the missile man, I'd call him up. And, and uh, I was representing the president the, who was candidate Kennedy uh, uh, to try to help him get to be president of the United States. And our, out of all that, outgrowth of that was that uh, John Sigenthal and I rented an apartment, stayed together during the campaign. And then after Bobby got elected, after Jack got elected, Bobby invited me to come stay at his house, live at his house, which I did for many months. And the, my mission was to read all the files in the Department of Justice on Jimmy Hoffa and determine uh, what we could do uh, uh, to, to prosecute Hoffa. And Bobby wanted to prosecute Hoffa with his whole being. It's, he had no question that Hoffa was a menace, that it was dangerous for the country, and that he had an obligation to take Hoffa on. And he and Hoffa had had this previous relationship that uh, they've spoken about when Hoffa insulted him and that sort of thing, and they despised each other, no question about it. And so I read these, these files, there were thousands of pages of these files on, by Jimmy Hoffa in the Department of Justice, and I'd read all these files, 
and I'd read all day long, and, we'd, and then I'd come back and read some more at night. And I'd ride with Bobby every morning and home at night from his house at, at uh, Hickory Hill uh, uh, to the Department of Justice. And, and just the two of us would be sitting in the back seat, drivers driving, and I'd have a chance to visit with him, talk to him during those, those 25 minute rides every morning, every night for all these months that I lived there. Incidentally, to make a long story short, I recommended against the Hoffa prosecution to buy, made Bobby furious. I mean, furious. I thought he was going to slap me. And finally, he stopped talking to me. And one night we were having supper uh, with the children and, and Ethel. And I said to Ethel, Ethel, would you tell the Attorney General if he doesn't start talking to me, I'm going to go home. I'm tired of this silent treatment. <laughs> and Bobby didn't say a word. And she said to him, Bobby, did you hear what he says? He's going to go home if you don't start talking to him. Bobby didn't say a word. And Finally, supper broke up, and we stayed around a little while, and I went up to my room to go to bed. Five o'clock the next morning, he uh, comes to my room, wakes me up, and he's on the way to Chicago to make a speech. And he said, well, if you won't try Hoffa, get me a lawyer. And I said, well, you've got 32,000 lawyers. Get your own lawyer. <laughs> and he said, don't be a smart ass. <laughs> uh, get me a lawyer. And so I talked to Sigenthaler about it. Sigenthaler and I were in cahoots. Sigenthaler was, the, was, was Bobby's administrative assistant, and he was a doorkeeper. You couldn't get in to see Bobby without going past Sigenthaler. So I didn't want to do anything that, that Sigenthaler and I'd have any disagreement about, so I, I checked out very carefully with Sigenthaler if he agreed with me about this. And I said, look, I sat next to a fellow in law school whose name is James F. Neal, and uh, I, I'd like to, for you to meet with him and talk to him. And so Bobby uh, said he would, and, they, and he did talk to him, and he did employ James F. Neal. And Neal prosecuted Hoffa, and unfortunately he had a hung jury. If I have just a second, I, 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 I think I ought to tell you this, because it's a part of the, of the pathos. The, you know, there's great pain in politics. Take it from a guy who's felt some pain. Uh, 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 there's a great pain in politics. Uh, and and uh, the, the fact is that, that the, the, this situation produced pain. And Tommy Osmond had been, had been contacted by Hoffa to represent him. And he comes over to my law office one afternoon and said, Hoffa's called me and asked me to represent him. I said, Tommy, don't do that. I'm telling you, Bobby's going to put him in the penitentiary just as sure as I'm talking to you. And, and uh, at least he's going to try. And, and Hoffa's response to that is he's going to fix the jury. Just as sure as I'm talking to you, Tommy, don't get in that. When, when Hoffa fixes the jury, since you're a local man here in Nashville, some of that's going to get off on you. And, and Tommy stood up and he said, well, you don't think I'd fix the jury, do you? I said, oh, of course, I don't think you'd fix the jury. But I'm telling you, he's going to fix it. And when he does, some of it's going to get off on you. Well, anyway, to make a long story short, uh, uh, Hoffa did fix it, and unfortunately, Tommy Osmond was involved in it. And then after they had this hung jury, Bobby called me back, and he says, now, now will you try this jury, will you try this, <coughs> this jury t uh, tampering case? I said, Bobby, I told you I'm not going to prosecute Hoffa, but if you really want to put him in penitentiary, get my papa. And so he got John J. Hooker Sr., uh, uh, and, and they, and they prosecuted, uh, he and Jim Nia went to Chattanooga, and prosecute Hoffman's in penitentiary. After that, Bobby wanted Daddy to prosecute Osmond and send Osmond to the penitentiary. I begged Papa. I said, Papa, don't do that. You and Jack, you and Tommy Osmond have drunk enough Jack Daniels whiskey together to sink a battleship. <laughs> You've been on these cruises together, and and you like Tommy. Tommy likes you. Uh, I don't prosecute Osmond. My father said, Why, well, my boy, he's defiled the temple of justice, and it's my responsibility and I'm going to prosecute him. He did prosecute him and did send him to penitentiary. About four years later, after he got out of the penitentiary, I ran for governor in 1966, and I got home one night, there was an envelope on my, on my pillow, and it was a letter from Tommy Osborne. It said, Dear John Jay, I, I quit smoking in order to send you this money. I want you to be governor of Tennessee. And he sent me $100 cash as a consequence of quitting smoking, and he was in the penitentiary compliments of my father. And so then a 
get out of the penitentiary, and a few years later, and my father calls me one afternoon. He says, this is the worst day of my life. And I said, what do you mean, Papa? He said, Tommy Osmond has just killed himself, and I feel like it's my fault. So I just shared that with you. The pain of it all was catastrophic. Tommy Osmond was a very intelligent man and a good man. He just over-identified. He thought that Bobby was mistreating Hoffa. He thought that he, he couldn't get Hoffa a fair trial, and he stepped across the line, not because he was a crook, but because he was a lawyer who just got too involved with it. And he made a mistake, ruined his life, and led him to commit suicide. Are you going to get in Baker versus Carr? He said, I told you I'm not going to do that. I said, well, I tell you what, I'm going to go see the boss. The President of the United States had to be a friend of mine. And you, after all, worked for him. I'm going to talk to your brother. And he said, you'd go to see him without me? And I said, I'm inviting you to go. He said, well, I'm not going. I said, well, I'm going. That night, he uh, goes to the White House, has supper with Jack. Next morning, we're riding back in limousine. He said, I talked to Jack. He says, we got the same problem in Massachusetts. Said, you go, Jack always called me Long John. Said, you go tell Long John. We got the same problem in Massachusetts. We're going to get in that case. And they got into Baker versus Carr. And if God is my judge, I don't think there's a chance in hell that Baker versus Carr would have ever come out of the Kennedy administration. And if not, the Kennedy administration would have never happened if it had not been that the President of the United States, the of the United States himself interceded with the Attorney General to instruct the Attorney General to go do this when the Attorney General didn't want to do it. So, big things are happening in Washington and in Nashville. Let me go back to Harris Gilbert, and uh, you've got uh, a story to tell. We've got it on tape, but I'd rather hear it from you and, and uh, share it with our folks. Uh, you, you mentioned the fact that you might have skirted a few rules to get your exhibits in at the trial level. How did you get the 1960 sentence, census before the Warren Court? Um, well, we had printed some 60. Can you, can you oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we, yes, uh, we had printed uh, voluminous exhibits that were before the court in the first hearing. The second hearing, by the time the second hearing came up, uh, for argument, the census had been published and all our exhibits were revised and I took about 60 70 pounds of exhibits I would not check them with baggage and I took them to, to Washington to be filed with the court so the judges could have before them the results of the 60 census which of course were worse than ever in terms of uh, mis uh, malapportionment and I got that I didn't know what to do do you file a motion to admit it? Do you have the, somebody make your opening argument that the, uh, there's now available the census material? All the maps are updated, all according to, you know, you can take judicial notice of census. That's, that's nothing for proving. You don't have to prove that. That's something that the court could take judicial notice of. And I had 60 or 70 pounds worth of stuff, and I took it to the clerk. I went back to the rule, because I was still a very young lawyer at that point. Uh, I think I was 30, 30 years old, maybe. And I said, you know, the thing I was taught was always go talk to the clerk of the court. They always try to help out young lawyers. And I went in there, and I said, I don't know what to do. They gave me this material, and I tried to be as, just as helpless as possible, because I was. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> and the clerk said, oh, Mr. Gilbert, I'm glad to see you back again. He says, don't you worry about this. I said, let's do this. I'll take the exhibits, and I'll take them in and stick them in front of the judges. And I'll have them sitting there, and that's better than you doing it. I said, yes, it is. <laughs> and I figured something would go wrong. It's going to be him, not me. And the clerk says, I know, I'm delighted. And said, the judges like this kind of thing. He says, you know, judges like to look at the statistics, believe it or not. They, 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 they want to see facts, and, and they'll, they'll look at it. And they did. I mean, the start of the opening argument, there they were fumbling through these things and going on. And so, of course, they updated the arguments, and you'll see it in the uh, opinions of Harlan and Clark and a certain degree uh, Brennan, uh, those exhibits. All right. But always use the clerk of the court when you don't know what you're doing. Now, it's the, uh, the maxim that I want to get across to you. <laughs> this is a little bit out of the program, but uh, 
Judge Merritt, if a lawyer were to do that today, uh, where do you suppose he'd be now? Well, the court can take judicial notice <laughs> of the census of the United States, obviously. And if um, a bunch of documents have been translated from the census, uh, the court, and if there is no objection, um, <laughs> and I guess there wasn't any objection. Might <laughs> <laughs> not have been any notice. <laughs> you, they, you can say liberal, judicial notice liberally in, construed would permit that to come in. And if nobody says anything to the contrary, then it happens. There it happens. It would happen today just like that. All right. Tom Osborne, you know, when the state Supreme Court rendered his decision, he made a statement in the newspaper that, uh, to a newspaper reporter, which basically said the Supreme Court was dead wrong and why couldn't they enforce the Constitution? And he was disbarred on the spot. Uh, it had not been announced. He was disbarred by the Supreme Court for doing that. And... Uh, Luckily, he had a friend who was, uh, at that time, a, a powerful man at the Supreme Court. He got him to reconsider it, and they said uh, they accepted Osborne's apology for being intemperate about it. Dick Lanson was the clerk of the court. Not Dick Lanson. Uh, Dave Lanson, excuse me, his brother, was the clerk of the Supreme Court, and he and Tommy were very close. And Tommy just lost his cool. He said, you know, the motto at the Supreme Court is, even though the heavens may fall, justice will be done. I believe that was the translation. It says they can't follow the motto that's up there above the Supreme Court. Uh, I want to, realizing that we have, we have to give short answers now, can any, the one of, any one of you three gentlemen give us any idea of, of what it was like to be a young lawyer back in the early 60s and be participating in something that we're now celebrating 50 years later as a landmark decision. What was it like, personally? John, you want to comment on that? Yeah, you know, I had the great advantage of being my father's son, and he was a great lawyer by anybody's definition, and there's some of who have Macklin Davis and others who are here in this room who will remember him. And a lot of people don't like me uh, I never have understood that, but I fact. <laughs> uh, 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 but I never knew anybody that didn't like my father. And, and maybe one of the reasons was that, uh, that he liked everybody. A and he was, a, Gil Merritt knew him well, and then many of you here, but Harris knew him. And, and, and so I had the, the advantage of, of, uh, of being his son and, and, and seeing it from, from the inside. And, there was, it was an interesting time. Uh, the, the, uh, this, the, the, uh, we're talking now, we got out of school in 57, wasn't it, uh, 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 Harris, or 58, 57, I believe? I got out of 57. 57. And so uh, uh, th this was an interesting time in Tennessee, and, and uh, 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 the questions were pregnant. There was, there was, a, uh, there was a friction, there was real cause, this, this, for example, Baker versus Carr, which is one of the examples of conflicts that were to be resolved. And you know, we got conflicts so many in the country today, and civility is, is hard to find, and, and compromise is hard to find. In those days, there was more civility. The, the compromise was more possible. Uh, people who did things uh, that were ill-advised, like when Tommy said that about the Supreme Court, he, he had the f good sense to apologize, and they had the good sense to say, okay, uh, go on. Uh, that sort of spirit doesn't exist in America today. It's a sour note for the country. We better reestablish it if we're going to make the democracy work to the salvation of the country. But it was an exciting time, and, and there are those who, Harris had the same uh, uh, privilege that I did. His father was a great judge. I adored his father. His father appointed me to a case, and, and, uh, and I took it to the Supreme Court of the United States and got 18 prisoners out of the penitentiary who were in there for the rest of their natural life as a, con as a consequence of, of, of my father's friendship with, with Harris's father and my father agreeing to pay the price of, of the cost of me appealing this case. So having seen it from the point of view of, of being privileged, as Harris saw it from the point of view of privilege, and Gil was likewise privileged, but uh, uh, it, was a, it, was, it was a time of, of energy and, and determination, and 
I feel greatly honored here at 82 years old to look back and think I was there when it happened. I, I think it's important to uh, see that this period that we're talking about in 1960, 61, when Kennedy was in the White House and the end of the Eisenhower term, we're talking about the time of greatest idealism that I know of in the Uni in United States history. We had won the Second World War. We were relatively unified. The economy was doing exceedingly well. Uh, the Supreme Court had just decided Brown versus Board of Education, one of the most liberal decisions in the history of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court decided quite a large number of very liberal cases for the next 15 or 20 years. And the parties in the United States, the Democrats and the Republicans, got along uh, well. They ran against each other, but as John Jay said, there was civility and there was compromise. There was not polarization. This period produced, in my view, the most idealistic period in the law that we've ever had in um, our country. And one of the results of that is Baker versus Carr. Now, Baker versus Carr, as it's turned out, has been a good decision, but the legislature of Tennessee is no better now than it was then. <laughs> <laughs> it may be worse. Amen. So there, well, so there are a lot of there are a lot of things that factor in, but the spirit of the times is a major factor and this, that was a different time, quite a different time from now. Yeah, that's a great segue to our next. I would uh, add just a couple of words. 30 seconds? Oh, well, I'm sorry, I thought you, what? It's gotta be 30 seconds. Uh, to me? Yeah, no, I just Harris. want to say that. Uh, You're done. A young lawyer in those days had a chance to take a case like this and although I got paid, it was, it was very minimally, so it was enough. But we law firms today do not like to see their young lawyers um, take these type cases very often, although there's some of them fee shifting. The Civil Rights Act uh, provided under Section 1983 for fee shifting, which helps a lot. But law firms today all want to see the billable hour, and I think sometimes they take away from the, from the thrill of these things. And Judge I, Barrett said so beautifully, this was a time of change in this country. Civil rights, civil liberties, chance for idealism, and today we unfortunately have gotten uh, We've, we've lost a little of that feeling. Right, right. Listen, I, I was a great admirer of President Kennedy, and I can recall in his inaugural address that he said that the torch had been passed to a new generation. These are three members of that generation, and they've done a fabulous job. Let's give them a thanks for being here today.